You've heard of the great resignation. Coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, 48 million Americans quit their jobs in 2021, followed by 51 million Americans in 2022. Emmy Neitfeldt, writing for the Atlantic Magazine, says, I walked away because of burnout worsened by the pandemic, along with a heightened sense that life is short. Quitting seemed like the path to taking control of my mental and physical well-being. Some kind of awakening occurred in people that their life in the workplace was not the way life should be. And surely they could find a better alternative path. Now the results of that quitting and whether it has led to greater fulfillment and happiness, they're mixed. For some people, quitting their job led to lots of new opportunities in their life. For others, quitting was just treating a symptom of a much deeper challenge in a person's life. Now I'm not your mom and I'm not your therapist. So I'm not going to give you some blanket idea this morning about how to decide when you quit something and when you stick with it. But what I do want to do is look at this story in Matthew's gospel and see how Jesus journeys with people who feel like they want to give up. Now, first, this parable today doesn't sound like it fits our Summer at the Lake series. But pay attention to the very beginning of how this passage starts. Jesus comes out of the house in Capernaum and he goes to the shore of the lake. The crowds press in on him and he gets into a boat and puts out on the water. And it's there that he begins to teach. Now he teaches the crowd, but among the crowd are his disciples. Just a while ago in the story, Jesus has sent those disciples out to do the things that Jesus does, to teach, to heal, to proclaim the coming reign of God. And now they've come back together to process that experience. And honestly, they haven't had a very good response. They haven't had George Beverly Shea singing Just As I Am. And the charter buses waiting in the parking lot outside the stadium for all the people who come forward to commit their lives to Christ. They haven't had the chance to take a selfie with a pop music sensation before immersing him in the baptismal waters. They don't have a story about how there were just eight of us with a vision from God and a prayer and we gathered in a living room. And now we have 2,000 people in worship every Sunday. They don't have those stories. They have had almost no response. And they are wondering if anyone actually has any interest in God's reign in the world, in a world directed towards justice and mercy and grace. They've come back feeling like failures, and they want to quit. Or maybe they don't want to quit entirely, but they want to engage in this new phrase that we've learned in recent months and years uh, called quiet quitting. Um, Amelia Nagoski talks about how people burn out in their work and then they turn to quiet quitting. This is how she describes it. Basically, when we have unmeetable goals, our brains can't handle it. Our frustration grows into rage until eventually we're dropped into a pit of despair. Then we oscillate between feeling frustrated rage and hopeless despair where we get stuck in a cycle of, I hate this job, they can shove it, oh no, I have bills to pay and children to raise, and I just can't quit, but holy moly, I just want to set that building on fire. The disciples have unmeetable goals. They are proclaiming the inauguration of the eschatological kingdom of God. They are oscillating between rage and despair. But they've left everything they know to go on this venture with Jesus. They can't go back with their tails tucked between their legs and their heads down in shame. So maybe quiet quitting is the best way to do it. Maybe they figure out what's the minimum we've got to do 
to stay on Team Jesus as we go about this journey and not be excommunicated from his fellowship. Anything short of selling him out for 30 pieces of silver and we'll probably be okay. So Jesus sits in the boat, addressing the crowd, addressing his 12 disciples. And he begins to tell the story about this farmer who goes out to sow his seed. And he throws some of the seed, and it lands on the path, and the birds come and gobble it up. And he throws some seed, and it lands in the rocky soil, so there's no depth. The plants grow up, but the sun scorches them. He throws some seed, it lands among the thorns, and it grows up with the weeds, and the weeds choke out the, the, the life of the plant. And then some lands in the good soil, where it yields this unbelievable harvest. And as they hear the story, James looks out across the lake to the fertile land that surrounds it and the plants and the crops that grow there, and he remembers his own labors in those annual harvests. John can't take his eyes off the boat where Jesus sits, remembering all those sunsets with their father Zebedee and his brother James as they would put out onto the sea with their nets to lay them out through the night to catch the fish. And then the day when they gave that all up at that same spot to leave those nets and go with Jesus to catch people. The old tax collector Matthew looks down and he sees the rocks at his own feet feeling their sharp edges as Jesus describes the rocky soil. And and Philip finds himself gazing up into the sky, watching the birds circling overhead, wondering how many seeds they had gobbled up from farmers. And Bartholomew does the math. He knows that for every bushel of, of grain, there should be 10 bushels, of seed, there should be 10 bushels of grain So this declaration that this yields 160 and 30 fold is unbelievable. It is an astronomical amount of harvest. See, this form of scattering seeds that the farmer undertakes, this was normal agrarian practice in Jesus' day. The farmer would go out with his satchel of seed and he would throw the seed knowing full well that some would land on a path Some would land in rocky soil, some would land among thorns, and some would land in the good soil, and it would generate a harvest. But the farmer doesn't quit because his percent yield isn't higher. He doesn't grow despondent watching the birds gobbling up the seed off the path or watching as the weeds choke out that segment of the crop. You see, here Jesus is doing two things for his disciples with this story. The first is he's taking them back to where their journey of faith began, where they first felt in the depth of their heart this call from God of who they truly were. They stepped out of those boats and followed Jesus on his path. He doesn't only recall the past in memory, but he takes them back there physically, bodily, feet in the sand, waves lapping the shore, the weathered boards of the boat creaking on the waters, the sea wind whipping through their hair. You can't only recount the call. You've got to go back to where you first heard it, felt it, knew it. Sacred space in bodily form. How do you know when to quit or what to keep? I think you've got to go back to the place where God spoke to who you truly were. And I think you've got to go back there physically, if at all possible. Not just in memory. 
You see, it's in these summer weeks that we try to cultivate this kind of connection through our own church's life. You middle schoolers who went to Massanetta, Christians have been gathering at that place for over 130 years to hear from Jesus. There are pictures in our chapel of people older than your grandparents standing outside the same auditorium where those worship services happen. Sacred space forged in vespers and energizers and slip and slides. And our high schoolers just got back from Montreat yesterday. Those creaky pews in Anderson Auditorium. Candlelight worship around Lake Susan. Late night back home conversations that linger in your mind into the morning. Or a week at Camp Bethel with morning songs and cafeteria chants, and nights sleeping out in the open under the stars, just like Jacob at the original Bethel when he first heard the voice of God. For others of you, that place has a name like New Hope, or First, or Westminster, or Calvary, or Christ, or maybe Raleigh Court, a place you went with other people where you heard of God and you felt something stir in you that was more real than what you'd ever known before. To know what to quit and what to keep, we need the place. We need the physical place where God met us. It redefines and it clarifies our calling. And then in this physical harvesting story, Jesus counters every American bias that we have about productivity and efficiency. We can't tolerate seed that doesn't create revenue. We need a policy to limit seed on pathway spillage. We need a fertilizer that will eliminate the thorns and the weeds. We need to increase seed to soil contact by pulling out all of that rocky earth. We look at this story and we look at how much of it doesn't work. But Jesus directs his attention to the seed that does fall in the good soil, and it creates a harvest beyond our wildest imaginations, bigger than anything that should ever happen. It's entirely unbelievable. He's teaching us in this story, his disciples, to see differently. So I came home from the beach on Tuesday. And you know how it is when you come home from the beach. You get home... In the afternoon, you have to unload your car. You have to get all the beach stuff back down in the basement. You need to get a load of laundry started. You got to unload all that leftover food. And we've been gone for a week. So what needed to happen? Mow the grass. So I don't have any gas for the mower. So I have to go down to the gas station. I get gas. But Simon has baseball practice at 530, and it's already 4 o'clock. And so I get back, and I fill the uh, gas can. I take the gas can. I fill up the mower. I literally jog mow my yard to get it done in time so that I can then take a shower, get Simon to baseball practice, go meet a couple for dinner whose wedding we're planning, and then get back to pick him up in time. Welcome home from vacation, right? Um, And so as I'm pushing the mower back up the backyard, I see this tiny little piece of red sticking out from behind the green leaves of the tomato plants in our raised bed, almost like it was playing hide-and-seek but wanted to be found. And so I stopped for just a second, and I pulled the leaf back, and there was the first cherry tomato of the season. And so I plucked it, and I popped it in my mouth, and the juices exploded over my taste buds. And that was a moment of seeing the harvest of God, a different kind of production, something to connect me again to land and to life. That's what the harvest of the kingdom of God looks like. 
It isn't measured in the ways that we're taught to measure success. It's a visit that goes too long with that new neighbor as you learn about the stories of their life and their struggles. It's the time you took to write that birthday card to somebody who you didn't think anybody else would remember on their birthday. It's uh, seeing that person three chairs down from you this very morning in worship whose soul is bursting with possibility or is carrying incredibly heavy burdens and knowing that God has brought you here together today, seeds to germinate. It's that aha moment when you're the teacher in the classroom. It's the meal served at the day shelter. It's onboarding the new person at work who's nervous and hasn't quite found their footing yet. It's paths and birds and thorns and soil and seed and harvest and sand and sea and boats and salt brine. what to quit, and what to keep. I think our ability to discern the answer to that question comes from knowing the deepest identity within us as it is connected to the place and to the people who have formed us. And then catching the vision that God cherishes of what God cherishes in this world. And so we step out in faith to see what harvest there might be. And the promise of Jesus is that that harvest is larger than anything we could imagine.